Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Vice President, General Manager, Cisco Miraki, Todd Nightingale. Uh, how's it going? How's it going? Thanks for being here. Day two of Cisco Live, this is the sweet spot. Everyone's still sober enough to come to the sessions. I'm super excited. This is our fourth Cisco Live as, as part of Cisco, and they've like upgraded to the middle day. I'm like glad to be here. So, um, For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Todd, and, and I look after the Meraki business uh, here at Cisco. Um, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of why Meraki? and um, what we've been doing lately, like what the direction is, uh, specifically around this concept of nimble IT, but we'll sort of cover what the major development directions are in the Meraki product line across the board. Um, but I thought, uh, I thought I might start with a, with a story. Um, my first job in networking uh, was in 1999. At Meraki, that ages me into the senior citizen category, but my first job in networking was in 1999 at a, a company called Codex. And actually, at that time, it was Motorola Codex. <laughs> For double bonus points, anyone know what Motorola Codex or what Codex built? What? Modems, yes, wow. You're the only person who's ever got that. I owe you a full stack of Meraki gear, my friend. You're, you're killing it, yeah. I, that is, that's hot, yeah. Um, Codex, Codex um, invented error correcting codes which became the first cable modem. They invented the cable modem. And um, I was so excited to have that job. It was my first job in networking. It was 1999, the year that Wi-Fi was fi finally became a thing, finally became ratified. And I felt like I was building the internet. It was 1999, I was building the internet. I didn't know what the internet was for back then. It was like, most people were like exchanging recipes on the internet in 1999, but, but I was building the internet, I was super excited. And I was excited about it because it was really hard and it was really interesting. That's what I was, that was what I was into. My professor was uh, key in, in founding Codex and he helped me get that job and I just, I could not love it more. But I, I, I was still in school up in Boston and so every day, I took a 45-minute drive from Boston down to Mansfield, which is where Codex was, and, uh, and it was great. After the first couple of weeks, I learned all the shortcuts, and Mansfield is right next to Foxborough, which is near Gillette Stadium, the home of the world champion New England Patriots. <laughs> and because of that, there was lots of traffic. There was lots of traffic, so I learned all the shortcuts. I had to learn every shortcut, and I did, and I really got good at getting there. On the way home from work, I was so happy driving home after my, my favorite job that I would usually call my best friend to find out where we were gonna meet up for dinner. Back then, girls didn't really talk to me, but my, uh, my best friend would eat, would eat with me. Back in 1999, how'd you call your best friend on your, on your way home, on your ride home? No worries, you pull over into a rest stop. <laughs> they had pay phones lined up like one car length apart, so you didn't actually have to get out of the car. You could pull your car up to a pay phone. You put a physical quarter into the payphone, and I would dial my best friend's phone number from memory, 617-784-4731. <laughs> and that was great, I, I loved that job. Um, today, I, I uh, manage the Meraki business, and to be honest with you, the first time ever, I love this job more than I loved that job. And I still feel like I'm building the internet, and I love that. And today, I don't live in Boston, I live up in San Francisco where the Meraki office is, but every couple of weeks, I get that call from Cisco, from San Jose, about heading down to, uh, to San Jose to read out the uh, state of the business or kiss the ring or whatever we do down there in, uh, in San Jose. <laughs> and that is about the same trip. It's about that same 45-minute drive down to San Jose. I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to get to Cisco Building 10 in San Jose, because I'm not stupid enough to try to route there myself. Google knows how to get there, and Google tells me, and every time it's different. Traffic in San Francisco is a total disaster, and every single time it's a different route, right? On my way home, I don't think twice about calling my girlfriend to find out where we're meeting up for dinner, and I do not know her telephone number. <laughs> and I checked, she does not know mine either, 
And if you want to check, she's right there, and you can ask her yourself. <laughs> the reality is that back in 1999, when I was working on the internet and I was loving life, um, maybe just a little bit, I helped contribute to, to all those changes around us. Most experts would say that all of those changes, we change the way we run our lives, are the, um, are the product of two major technology trends. One is the internet, and the other is mobile devices. And those two things, massive technology shifts in those two areas, have led to the fact that I don't know how to get places anymore, I don't remember people's phone numbers, I expect to be able to download anything at any time from anywhere. Right? And that's awesome. I mean, I really think the, the world has changed. In 1999, just to be honest, I did not see any of that. It's not like anyone I was working with in Mansfield was like, oh yeah, we're changing the world, so people will be able to get geo-located directions in real time. No, like, we just thought it was hard and interesting. But it happened, but it happened. This, this change around the world happened. And to be honest, it didn't just happen for me, right? Um, it happened for everyone. Right? My girlfriend, she doesn't know how to get places either. She doesn't remember my phone number. She sends me pictures that move every day. Right? That technology is accessible not just to me, but to her and my mom and everyone. Right? You did not need to be an expert. It did not require training. There's no CCIE in understanding how to use Google Maps. Right? And the beauty of that, I think, is really unlocked by a third trend. Yes, it's the internet, and yes, it's mobile devices, but what made it accessible to everyone, and not just people really avid technologists, is this idea of simplicity. That was the third trend, right? And companies like Apple and Google, they forced that issue in the consumer space. They forced it to be simple, because that's how they knew they would get adoption. And in a lot of ways, for consumer and residential business, that drove the industry. On the enterprise side, enterprise technology, the technology has gotten even more powerful, dramatically more powerful, right? And it's in mobile devices, in applications, in server technology, in networking and internet technology, but simplicity really didn't come to this part of the industry, right? Instead of simplicity, we got training programs and consultants and contractors and all sorts of like a cottage industry of dealing with the complexity, right? And that's sort of where Meraki comes to be, is into that world, right? Because the reality is that worked for a long time. That got us here to this place. But we're sort of at a turning point, right? IT groups around the world are starting to be asked to do more than just keep the internet running, keep the phones up, make the lights work, right? I talk to customers uh, just about every day um, nowadays, and almost all of them will tell me the same thing. Look, I want to keep the network working, but I'm the CIO of Oakland Unified Schools, and what I care about is technology for education. I care about distance learning and digital test taking and leveling the playing field between rich and poor schools using technology. He is interested in technology for education. And I see the same thing in hospitality and retail. Everyone in technology is being asked to impact the business and impact the mission. It's not just about uptime. It's about finding ways to use technology to, to pursue your missions, right? And that really is the, the mission of Meraki, right? Is understanding this idea that technology can connect us, and it can drive us, it can empower us, but by simplifying powerful technology, we can free passionate people like you to focus on your own mission and your own passion. And that is the focus of Meraki. And maybe even reach a few groups that up until now have been left in the darkness, that the complexity was just too great and they just couldn't make it work, right? This is the Meraki mission and this is what our teams sort of focus on. This is our true north, right? Making powerful technology simple so that IT groups around the world can really focus on their own mission and kind of get out of the weeds of building the most sophisticated network in the world. Right? Maybe that should be simple enough so we could get back to using technology to make hotel guests happier and shoppers more likely to buy. Right? This is what the Meraki portfolio looks like. Right?
started out as cloud managed wireless. And that, that started out back in 2006. We're like 11 years old right now. I can't believe that. That's pretty great. It's pretty great. And it took a couple of pivots along the way, but pretty soon our customers who were really using Meraki Wireless, they were the ones who told us, look, wireless is only a small part of my network. If you want to simplify my operations so that I can get back to doing what I'm really passionate about, I need more of my infrastructure Meraki-fied. We did not invent that word, by the way. Uh, but it's real. And we moved from wireless to security, to a UTM solution, and on from there to switching, right? And about that point, that's when Meraki was acquired with a cloud-managed networking portfolio, these first three components, right? And I think it's sort of interesting to note that when we were acquired, nobody at Cisco and really no one at Meraki was talking about those three product lines, right? They were talking about Meraki dashboard, right? The cloud management, that's the real flagship product at Meraki. Meraki dashboard is the point. It's what provides the simplicity, right? I love uh, Meraki access point more than any other piece of technology in the world probably, but it's the cloud and the management that differentiate this from the rest of the market and that, that realize this dream of simplifying powerful technology. As part of Cisco, our mission has been now to expand to cloud managed infrastructure, really approaching the market the same way Cisco does, being the number one IT partner. Right? And that's been our mission, moving from MDM to telephony, to the phone, and onto the camera. And to be honest, we actually went back to our MX platform and added SD-WAN routing into that as part of Cisco, as part of Cisco's SD-WAN initiative a couple of years ago, right? What's really important isn't the individual products, it's the cloud. And that, that concept is incredibly powerful from a product engineering point of view, right? When we launch a new product at Meraki, it inherits all the features from the cloud. It has best in class cloud authentication, data replication, cloud resiliency, management best practice enforcement, all of that stuff come with, come with the cloud, right? And that actually makes it incredibly powerful. If when we build a uh, cloud feature at Meraki, like better analytics or data storage, better user management, any of that stuff, it affects all of the platform, right? And that's great from an engineering leverage point of view, but for for the users of the system, what's really more important is the idea that once you're comfortable using the Meraki cloud to manage your switches or your wireless, adding cameras or routers or firewalls is dramatically easier. We see in the stats that once people become proficient using, let's say, wireless from the Meraki cloud, adding switches or routing or firewalls is a dramatically easier experience. We see fewer support calls. We see faster onboarding of the products, faster provisioning of the equipment, right? It's remarkable. And there's real power in this, this true single pane of glass approach. I think that maybe the best example of this might be the camera that we uh, just launched a couple of quarters ago, three quarters ago. Um, I'm sort of proud to say we launched what might be the least feature complete camera on the market. In true MVP fashion, in true MVP fashion, right? We released a camera that had the core value proposition of being the easiest to manage, easiest to monitor camera on the market, right? And we achieved that by removing the need for a DVR and VR solution, right? No custom software runs right on your browser. Nothing else is required. Camera, license from Meraki, up and running, right? And really almost no other feature. Uh, <laughs> Maybe one other feature. Motion search is pretty cool. We'll take a look at it in a minute. But that was the only other real feature, right? But that's not really true. The reality is that camera was launched as a native Meraki product. And it came with best in class enterprise cloud management. Redundant data centers around the world, tertiary backups. It came with the best user management, SAML and everything. Everything that the Meraki Cloud came with. On day one, it launched with all of that stuff. It was the easiest launch we've ever had to do because of that. And, and actually, by far, the, the most successful. Right. As part of Cisco, we've had sort of 
it, it almost feels like a little bit of an unfair advantage when it comes to this play, right? When you start to think about, about kind of leveraging technology, leveraging powerful technology and making it simple with cloud management, being part of Cisco, it's like a dream come true. What does Cisco have? It has the largest sales team in the world. It's got an amazing channel. It's got an awesome brand. It's got phenomenal marketing, obviously. We're here at, in Vegas. Um, but Cisco has like the richest networking IP portfolio in the world, by far, by far. And when it comes to trying to find best in class, powerful technology and bring it into the cloud to leverage that cloud simplicity, you could not be pulling from a better IP portfolio than Cisco's. And actually it comes in two motions here, right? Number one is we're able to grab kind of the best and most powerful technology from around Cisco that already exists. RF excellence, four by four access points, ultra high density access points, up until now only available in the Aeronet line. We've had uh, great stacking, stackable switches, fiber switch releases, all this stuff that we are learning and taking from the Cisco IP portfolio, right? That's kind of the traditional portfolio. Cisco, after they bought Meraki, they didn't kind of, they didn't close up shop acquisition-wise. They continue to buy companies and were able to go out and leverage those new acquisitions as well. We just launched Threat Grid on the Meraki MX yesterday, right? AMP from Sourcefire has been available for quite a while and Umbrella from the OpenDNS acquisition is already available on some platforms and, and coming to the rest of them, right? It's an amazingly powerful ecosystem. We can go and find really best in class powerful technology and bring that into Meraki in a, in a native, native way, right? Another piece of this strategy has really been around DNA. Did people see the uh, Wolverine launch and, and information on DNA Center? People pretty, I feel like if you're here, you're, you're, you're read into that stuff. The beauty of DNA Center is that we'll finally have one pane of glass that can monitor all of your infrastructure, both Meraki and on-prem, and that's great, right? But there's actually kind of an underlying principle here. That's all being done using APIs, REST APIs. And about a year ago, we launched, as part of DNA, the Meraki developers community. Right? And that developers community was designed to publish all kinds of APIs, not just provisioning and monitoring, but analytics APIs and captive portal APIs, locationing, all that stuff to everyone. So your teams and partners and development partners could build features on top of those products. And now we're using those same APIs to integrate with Cisco management products like DNA Center. That's like super powerful. And as those APIs continue to evolve and strengthen, they won't become like Cisco proprietary APIs. All Meraki APIs will be published out to the world so that this platform that's really enabling the simplicity of management can also be extensible, right? And that people can start building on top of it. We've talked a lot about the API uh, strategy, and if you go to DevNet, you'll hear Meraki talks on API, and we've pushed super, super hard. But I did want to just have one, one piece of information which I don't think we've made super clear, and that's sort of the why, why open the platform. I've even had people ask, like, you know, it doesn't feel like coding Python scripts on top of a REST API is like the super simplest thing Meraki's ever asked me to do. And I, and I, I understand that point of view. But the beauty of opening up the API is so that people can really customize it to fuel their mission, right? They can use the Meraki dashboard to get all of their equipment up and running, to keep the network running with using very, very few resources. And then once you've got kind of operational excellence, you can use the APIs to write that, and that uh, hospitality app or that retail app to, use, to integrate the in, in infrastructure into how your teachers teach or how your governors govern, govern, right? And that's sort of this key to driving the mission, right? Is letting the platform take the operational complexity down but be open enough for you then to leverage it to really drive your mission and your passion, and, and, and that's the key. Um, the, the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about today is how how we do that. We talked about why, but like, how does simplicity help, right? There's, um, there's certainly two 
two sides of this coin. I mean, obviously, if it's simple, maybe it takes less time and fewer resources to work on something, and that's going to keep you focused on your mission. That's great. And I, uh, I'm passionate about that. But I think there's another side to that coin, too, and that's this idea of being nimble, right? At Meraki, especially on the dev side, we talk a lot about taking risk and celebrating failure and being able and flexible enough to try things out and see how they work, right? And I'll, I'll tell you what, the key to being able to do that, the key to being able to take risk is to be nimble, right? No one wants to take a risk with their IT infrastructure. I mean, no one wants to take a risk with their IT infrastructure, full stop. <laughs> but no one wants to take a risk on a new configuration, let's say, if it takes a project manager, a team of 10, and three months to implement it, and then possibly another three months to roll it back. I mean, no one's going to do that, all right? And so that's why the infrastructure has to keep people nimble so that we can be flexible and can kind of progress these systems and make them better over time. The, the thing I sort of regret about a lot of the ways that uh, I, I built networking technology back in 1999, I guess, and, and way back when is, like, the networks just got to be super, super powerful. Right? Networkings were, networks were powerful and flexible and comprehensive, but they became very brittle. You would configure up a network, template out the CLI files, push this stuff out to hundreds and hundreds of sites, and then once everything was set up, do not touch. Don't touch the network. And then we built all this infrastructure, control change windows and permissioning and made sure no one would ever touch it because any, anyone touching it had this possibility of breaking something, right? This concept that network was super powerful but brittle, right? If we can make the networks nimble, if we can make infrastructure nimble, then we can start to really evolve it and progress it and make it better and better as we go. So I wanted to show you a little bit of what that looks like uh, in the Meraki cloud. See how we do here. This is like one of the only times when I don't trust Wi-Fi. So I have a wired connection today. I'm really excited about it. Uh, this is the Meraki dashboard. This is uh, what it looks like if you load up uh, Meraki corporate headquarters, right? And it, it's pretty great. You can see core and SFO wired servers that are pumping out a huge amount of traffic, right? This is all sorted by amount of traffic. And that's actually on purpose. Our uh, engineering team uses those uh, servers to load stuff up to the cloud and, and stuff like that. So that's not too uh, outrageous. But if I look, I, I got Jay Zidimer. His name is Joe. He runs operations for me. I really have no idea why he ran 173 gigs of, <laughs> of bandwidth in the last uh, 24 hours. Or Vic Singh, who's actually here at Cisco Live. I don't know why his desktop is driving. 132 gigs, I mean, that, that stuff seems crazy. And if I wanted to, I could drill in and find out what's going on and sort of understand that. In fact, um, the Meraki system has a, uh, it has new summary reporting, something we just released and actually quietly released, may maybe too quietly, uh, something called anomalous behavior detection in Meraki reporting. Um, this is. This is technology that's taking an enormous amount of data, bringing it into the cloud, and analyzing it for outlying events, right? Clients that are, you know, every Tuesday this client's never in the office, but today he took 173 gigs. Like, that can't be right, right? And that anomalous behavior engine is actually incredibly powerful. I ran this report earlier today, and it actually was able to pick Jay Zinmer and Vikram Singh and one other client over 100 gigs. Like, we really got to call Vic. <laughs> it's, uh, something's wrong. But if I, if I didn't want to call Vic and instead I wanted, to, I wanted to take my network for a swing here, right? Like, I want to see, um, I want to see if maybe if I change the policy, could I fix that kind of thing, right? And I want to be able to experiment with that. Maybe not even, I don't want to commit my whole network to it. I just want to experiment, be nimble, take some risk here and see if I can solve this problem quickly and easily. So maybe the easiest way for me to do that would be to experiment with group policies. And I can go over here and click on group policies, and it, it brings me up. Our IT group has done a pretty good job cleaning this up. We used to have 83 group policies no one used. Now we've got only 10, and many of them are used, not by that many people, but some. And if I, if I wanted to, I could add an experimental group, and, I, and that's what I'm going to do here, right? So I'll add a group. 
called experimental. I'm not going to schedule it, but I could. I could say, oh, this is only available from 10 to noon or something. Uh, but I think it's possible that these guys who are using all this bandwidth, maybe they're using the wrong applications, right? And using this tool, I can actually go in and bandwidth shape each individual application if I wanted to. I could even go in to the, the dashboard and see what applications are using all this bandwidth. Like iTunes used 154 gigs yesterday. Like, that doesn't seem so great. Maybe I want to experiment with a policy that, that works on shaping that. And so I can go into my experimental group policy and I could turn on traffic shaping. So I'm going to build custom traffic shaping rules here, add a new shaping rule, go in, look for iTunes, which I think is under music and video. And I could say, look, in this case, I'm going to uh, choose a limit and I'm going to take that limit down to one meg. Like you can download from iTunes, but like one meg at a time. If you're listening to music on iTunes, one meg is great. If you're like bulk downloading iPhone uh, firmware updates, maybe you can do that slower than you needed to uh, in the past. And that's great. And, and here's my like network uh, shaping rule of thumb. I always block BitTorrent. Strong recommendation. Probably almost no one here needs people stealing movies on their corporate network. So I would probably do that. I'd add a layer seven firewall rule. And I'd go to peer to peer, and I could pick BitTorrent up here and do that. And you can deny any application. You can even go custom. There's certain websites like no one ever needs to go to. Like here's a good one. We could block all the time, no problem. <laughs> right. um, and look, so this policy here, uh, I didn't, I didn't need a lot of training. I don't have a CCIE. I, I was able to build this in the Meraki cloud and, and save it and, and bring it up. Um, and it hasn't done anything. It's just a new policy in the system, and it's sitting there. But if I wanted to, I could go and see what it looks like if I take Vic and, and Joe and subject them uh, and subject them to this. In fact, I can do that in just a couple of clicks. So if I went back to my clients and I found Joe and Vic and I wanted to say, hey, guys, like, get with the program here. I could do that. Oops, I have to reload this. I could do this, and I could apply that group policy to them directly. right? And that would run that experiment and see if shaping iTunes and controlling BitTorrent would actually change that. And I could try it on hundreds of clients or two clients, and I can experiment with it and be more nimble and see how that works. Right? I, I think that's um, like one of the best examples of how you can do this, right? I, I've run projects just like this, advanced bandwidth shaping, deep packet inspection, deployed over hundreds of sites with traditional equipment, and it literally, it took a project manager and weeks of consulting and uh, templating CLI files, and like, man, that just can't be how we spend our time in 2017. It can't be, it can't be. Camera deployment, I think, is a, is a great example of this. These deployments have been going up almost faster than any other part of the Meraki portfolio. They, when the cameras arrived, they get deployed super, super quickly. And I actually had to go to our product manager and find out why that was. And he's like, well, there's, I mean, you plug it into PoE, and then there's nothing else left. If you, if you get a DHCP address, then your camera's running. Like, there's nothing else to configure. Like, that's truly zero touch. If you plug this camera in, it comes up. Like, that's, that's pretty compelling to me. And we've, um, and we've been running cameras at Meraki for quite a while. It almost left me with the feeling like, man, it's so nimble and so easy to deploy a camera like that, but maybe it's lacking power, right? I was so proud that we released this low feature set camera uh, a year ago, nine months ago. Man, I, I, as I review all the features that have been rolled out week after week after week on the camera, I, I'm, I'm changing my tune now. I mean, it's become incredibly powerful. A camera with built-in storage and a built-in analytics package that comes all together rolled up into one solution, right, is incredibly powerful. This is the cameras we have running in our office. And uh, right behind my desk, there's this small company called Uber, small transportation company. And they are building a corporate office behind my desk that will it, no doubtedly block out the sun. It's meant to be like ridiculously tall. And uh, the team actually just took a camera and pointed it out right behind my desk. So this is what the back of my desk looks like every day. And I get to see what Uber's working on. And every day, I get to see who's, who's building what. It's super great. Um, 
And this is, the, this is the analytics feature we shipped with, in fact. You can always do motion search, and on this space, if I wanted to see what trucks came into this site, I can click motion search, put a little box over here, and it'll show me all the motion that I had only on that one box. So motion through that space. And it takes about a second, and it, it gives me all these hits, and if I take a look at, the, uh, at those events, each of those events have motion going through that box. And you can see this truck is driving out there, and went through the box. So like that motion search is super powerful and that shipped with the product right on, on day one. But the features around this camera portfolio have been getting richer and richer every day. Like on camera encryption, better permissioning, different ways to export the video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the coolest one and my favorite is built-in motion analytics. So I can actually look at Uber's build out on an hour by hour basis and see where the motion was on that hour, which is not that interesting today. But if I look at it day by day, instead of hour by hour, I pull up analytics for, uh, for the whole week. So that pulled a week's worth of motion analytics, frame by frame analytics at about a second. And it shows me how much work is being done at this site every day. And I can see, great, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they did some work. Saturday and Sunday, almost no work. And for some reason, on Monday, they like barely showed up for work. That's good for me. The slower this building comes up, the more sunlight I get. That makes me happy every day. I like to check in on Uber's progress about once a week. So, um, Look, I, I think this is the key, right? Being nimble by staying simple, but really adopting this most powerful technology we can from around the, uh, from around the company. And uh, I really appreciate you guys hanging in there and uh, spending a half hour with us. Thank you so much. Cheers.